so today I have a pleasure to introduce our dear colleague, Ted Pina, from uh, the Classics Department. Ted and I share a common friend, Peter Bale, who <laughs> used to be a postdoc here, and a very lively person, and through Peter, I got to know Ted a little bit. We also share um, our love for pottery, that I think both Ted and I um, really mm, like to work on pottery. So when I looked at the title today, uh, the Palatine <coughs> Pottery Project, the study and online publication of the 20 tons of pottery from downtown Rome. Um, you beat me. I've got about four tons of pottery from one of my sites. And these are metric tons, too. So, oh. <laughs> so um, please welcome Ted. Thank you, uh, Junko. Uh, yeah, so I guess the lights should go down. Um, hi, I'm going to talk about uh, research I've been doing in Rome for pretty much most of my post-PhD life. Uh, I've been super busy the last few weeks, so it's not going to be the most organized or content-rich talk you'll ever hear. Uh, and I also wrote it with the assumption that there would probably be no uh, classical archaeologists or classicists in the room. That turns out to be a false assumption. Uh, but I'm uh, kind of leaning on uh, more methodological issues that I thought might be of interest to people, principally in an anthropology department. So uh, that's my uh, apology here uh, at the beginning. Um, so I'll lead you through a bit of the history of the work, and then uh, I'll talk a bit about the methods, and then a bit about uh, what we're doing to try to publish our results. So that's basically the scheme. Uh, what I'm talking about is the Roman period pottery assemblage from excavations carried out in uh, downtown Rome at the northeast corner of the Palatine Hill uh, by a joint project of the American Academy in Rome and the uh, Soprintendenza Archeologica di Roma, the, the Rome branch of the Italian Antiquities Service, uh, under the direction of uh, Eric Hostetter from uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, from 1989 to 1996. And I was the uh, I'm the, the specialist in charge of studying and publishing the pottery. Uh, but uh, to give you uh, an idea of where we are, uh, this is the northeast corner of the Palatine Rome. That's what it looks like, the Colosseum, or the Flavian Amphitheater right here. This is the famous monument, the Arch of Constantine, right here. And we're just over the fence inside the archaeological park um, right here. It's this interesting uh, mid-late imperial uh, building in brick-faced concrete that uh, was uh, jutting out uh, of the uh, lower slopes of the Palatine Hill. And uh, the basic research design was kind of a, a classic Roman topographical one, uh, figure out what was going on in this corner of this uh, uh, central important place uh, in the Roman Empire. Um, the site was decide, divided up into four sectors. Uh, you can, uh, I'm showing you this in part because you can see the structures as they jut out. Uh, uh, a series of parallel barrel vaults with uh, uh, another layer of structures on top. This very confusing uh, set of structures over here in sector A. Uh, the building was modified many times and probably never finished. The joke was is because he couldn't really tell what kind of building it was. It's probably a, a high-end residence. Um, was that it was an apse factory because we kept finding apses, cutting apses, cutting apses, and it was uh, probably because of all of the uh, kind of rethinking of how they were going to do things. Um, uh, sector C was kind of a bust. This was all uh, area that had been heavily, heavily disturbed in the modern period. Uh, and sector D was a, a set of largely unrelated things uh, uphill. But uh, those four site sectors will, will come back when I start talking about our, our publication. That's why I show you that plan. Um, this is a view looking uh, from west to east across uh, sector A uh, when the excavations are in progress. You can see some of those apses. That's my former colleague at University of Buffalo where I was before I came to Berkeley, uh, Bradley Alt, who was a sector supervisor. Um, and here's a view down into one of the deeper chambers uh, where excavations punched down to try to get back to uh, understanding a bit of what was going on topographically in this corner of the Palatine Hill uh, before the construction of this building. Uh, that's Luis Roll, an archaeologist from Norway. Uh, the project uh, involved all of the foreign institutes up on the Janiculum Hill in Rome, the Americans, the Norwegians, and the Finns, uh, and so it was an international project. 
Um, and I show you this slide to give you some idea about why there's 20 tons of pottery. Um, most of the structure had been pretty much drifted under uh, a massive amount of uh, late imperial, basically from the later third into probably the end of the fifth or maybe the early sixth century common era, uh, dumping, which filled up all of these substructures of the building and made it difficult for our architectural historians and topographers to get their job done, but what it meant was that for those of us who were working on processing the finds, we had massive amounts of material. Uh, and you see here one of the fills inside one of the, the smaller uh, barrel vaults in the structure. Um, the materials were processed and stored off-site, uh, so here's a Google Earth image of uh, Rome, and uh, so we're uh, right down here, uh, here's the, uh, actually I've misplaced that, that should actually be about over here, here's the Colosseum, here's the Forum, here's the Palatine Hill, and, uh, oh I see, this has shifted somehow, and, huh, that's weird, yeah, this should also, uh, be, I hope this won't be throughout my uh, slideshow, um, uh, this should be on the American Academy in Rome, which is actually right there, which is at the highest point in the city, the top of the geniculum or the, the geniculo. So every Friday, this, literally this uh, sort of, uh, flatbed truck would carry uh, many, many scores of cassette, the standard plastic crates that you put fines in uh, from uh, our temporary storage down uh, in the uh, Forum Palatine Archaeological Park up to uh, one of the uh, different uh, structures at the American Academy in Rome and uh, offload all of this material uh, and we would then uh, uh, charge uh, part of the team to uh, stay off site and uh, have to sit in the shade and drink beer and uh, uh, high atop Rome and, and scrub pot sherds uh, all day uh, so we could get this uh, material uh, processed. Um, and then we would set it out in our drying screens. Here you see several uh, lots of pottery that uh, are uh, out in these wooden screens with mesh bottoms so they can uh, dry in the sun. Uh, here's a detail looking into one. Um, I assume probably no one out there is familiar with any of this pottery, but if you're Roman pottery specialist, you can look into that and start saying, oh yeah, this is this, this is that, that's that, right? So uh, this stuff is all uh, quite familiar to me. As I'll point out in a few minutes, it comes from uh, many, many different parts of the uh, Roman world, the, the Roman Empire. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a little bit about what the basic assemblage is like. Um, we have a certain amount of uh, high-end tablewares, uh, things like uh, bowls and, and cups and plates and things of that sort. Um, and in the Roman imperial period, what this basically is, is material made with a really fine grain, generally carbonate uh, uh, ceramic paste. And it's covered with a red uh, slip, which centers a little bit when fired, so it get, gets quite shiny and glossy. Uh, it's not a glaze, it's a slip. Um, and the uh, earliest uh, uh, industry of this was that centered around Arezzo, uh, and modern scholars have called that terra sigillata. Uh, and, uh, and what happens is that uh, from when this industry takes off in the later first century B.C. into the first century, I guess I should say C.E., um, what you find is around the Roman Empire, kind of in a, uh, a series of processes that are in effect import substitution, different provinces begin uh, mimicking this and making their own versions of it. So in the upper left you see a few sherds of actually Italian, Italian sigillata. Uh, probably made in Arezzo, although there were other centers. Um, in the lower right, what you see is what we call South Gallic sigillata, because already by the first century AD, there are workshops in South and Central Gaul and making quite, uh, quite nice uh, imitations of this. Um, it's easy for a pottery specialist to look at it and tell the difference, particularly if it's broken, uh, but I imagine your average consumer in the Roman world would have been different to the difference and maybe been unable even to um, distinguish them. Uh, eventually beginning the first century AD, but particularly taking off in the third and fourth centuries AD, uh, what one finds is an explosion of this sort of regional production of uh, this uh, red slip tableware in Roman North Africa, particularly in uh, uh, the part of the province of Africa Proconsularis, uh, later given other names under reorganization that more or less corresponds to uh, the modern nation-state of, of Tunisia. And so here I show you a couple of uh, pairs of sherds of what we would call uh, African Sigillata C, which is made in central Tunisia, and African Sigillata D, which is made in northern Tunisia, somewhere up in the, the Tunis uh, Carthage area. Um, we have a substantial amount of cookwares uh, in our site assemblage. Uh, and so in the upper left, what you see are some examples of what is our standard regionally manufactured cookware. You can see a lot of it has, uh, has, um, has sooting on it. 
Um, in the lower right, you see three examples of what we call African cookware. It's an interesting phenomenon that this super high quality cookware was manufactured basically in three different forms, uh, principally in northern Tunisia, and exported around much of the Roman world. Uh, in many uh, cons consumer contexts at Rome and in Rome's port Ostia, for example, in the uh, fourth century AD, you find as much cookware originating in Tunisia as you might originating in actually in, in West Central Italy. Uh, I show you in the lower left uh, assured of, uh, we have a, a very small amount of uh, what are uh, hand-built cookwares, um, some made probably in Sardinia, as I think this shirt was, uh, some perhaps in uh, the island of Pantelleria, uh, which shows up in this persistent but very minor uh, presence in the site assemblage. But it's interesting to think about the dynamics of uh, manufacture and exchange, which also lead to very small amounts of this, this hand-built cookware uh, that is not thrown on a wheel, uh, showing up in a site assemblage in downtown Rome. Uh, you get various sorts of utilitarian wares. On the upper left is your standard regionally manufactured uh, utilitarian ware, which we just call fine ware because it's got a very fine body made in a local marine clay. Um, to gussy it up a bit, uh, they sometimes will uh, cover vessels with a fairly low quality reddish slip. Um, very, very rarely, and here's one shirt of that, they actually uh, uh, cover it with a, a true glaze that's kind of a, a greenish to turquoise color. The Romans uh, did uh, possess glaze technology, but they very rarely um, cared to avail themselves of it. It's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's probably imitating faience when they do this. Um, and though we're right, inevitably we have African wares as well. We find a certain amount of utilitarian wares that are produced in North uh, Tunisia and Central Tunisia also showing up in our site assemblage. Um, the bulk of our material though, by weight, something like about 80%, uh, and I should say that the cookware is about 10%, uh, the other things are about 10%, but then the transport amphoras are about 80% by weight. Um, and probably people have some idea about what transport amphoras are. are. They're these standardized uh, terracotta containers uh, for the packaging and distribution of uh, principally uh, certain basic foodstuffs in the Roman world, including uh, wine, uh, olive oil, and then this family of what we call uh, processed fish products, including things like fish sauces like garum and fillets of fish and, and things like that. We call those semi-liquids. A few other things are also transported in transport amphoras. But the long and the short of it is this, is that different regions and locales around the Roman Empire had characteristic uh, classes or kinds of transport amphoras uh, that uh, were increasingly able to show were for the most part employed for packaging a particular kind of food stuff. Uh, and uh, if you master this material, that gives you uh, the opportunity to use this discarded terracotta packaging as a proxy you see for the the production and distribution of foodstuffs around the Roman world. Um, and so again, uh, I can look at this slide and tell you yeah, that's a K26, which is a little bit uh, argued about what it held, but probably a fish products amphora from northern or central Tunisia. Uh, that's a K52, which is a wine amphora uh, from uh, Calabria. Uh, that one on the right, which looks like they put the handles on upside down, uh, is a wine amphora uh, from uh, Roman Egypt. Uh, these couple of sherds down here are your, your bullet-shaped uh, Gaza wine amphora, which is used for packaging wine from Gaza. And uh, lower right, that's your late Roman III, uh, which is a, uh, an amphora used for packaging wine, probably from the Meander Valley in, in what today is uh, Anatolian Turkey. And so um, these things are all, all pretty well studied. Um, and uh, the next slide, though, will kind of uh, maybe, I hope it's not invisible to you, but it'll, it'll show you a bit of where around the Roman world uh, we have amphoras from. Uh, we actually probably haven't counted them up. We probably have a few score different sorts of amphoras we've identified by now. This is just a subset of some of the more important ones. But you see things like uh, the famous Dressel 20, the big globular amphora that's produced mainly in Andalusia in southern Spain, uh, Roman Baetica, which is uh, a, a, a major uh, uh, package for olive oil. Uh, you see things like a, a South Gallic wine amphora over here. Uh, things like a, a Palestinian uh, wine amphora over there called the Havit, for example, in, uh, in Hebrew. And so uh, what this allows us to do then is to uh, get some sense about the uh, supply of these various foodstuffs from various parts of the Roman world to uh, the center of the empire. 
uh, over a period, I neglected to mention the dating of our deposits, of, of roughly about four or five hundred years. They tend to pick up about the middle of the first century CE uh, and probably run down to uh, the end of the fifth century CE and maybe into the early sixth century CE. It's a little bit difficult for me to figure out when the main part of the sequence ends. Um, one other point I want to make about working with Roman pottery is, uh, I hope, brought up by the slide, and that is um, you're not compelled to, uh, now don't take offense for historians, uh, to act as if you're a prehistorian. Uh, Roman archaeology is not quite an historical archaeology, let's say, as, as Laurie Wilkie may practice it, uh, but we, we do have access to written texts of various sorts uh, in kind of, you know, a spasmodic, uneven way, I guess. Um, now, if you're working in the center of the empire in the imperial period, you're, you're somewhat favored because there's a high likelihood that you're going to have certain sorts of, of a text that you can draw on uh, to provide context for interpreting your pottery. Uh, and this is something that, over the years, I've taken seriously and, and, and worked hard on. That is, to try to exhaust the possibilities of, of, uh, of using these sorts of documents uh, or uh, or uh, uh, works of literature to provide a context. So I show you here on the upper left, uh, here's a shot of a hand grasping an ostracon, uh, a temporary document made on a pot shirt, actually on a piece of a wall of, of African transport amphora, uh, which was found in the uh, uh, harbor area of Carthage, the great port of Roman North Africa, uh, that uh, records uh, nitty gritty of the state's efforts to uh, uh, to mobilize and weigh olive oil collected as tax in kind in the later fourth century and then package it and then ship it out probably in substantial measure uh, to Rome to uh, 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 provide a, uh, a significant portion of the olive oil subsumed, uh, consumed by the, the plebs urbana, the, the population of Rome. Um, and uh, I got interested in these at one point. Uh, I hadn't heard about them before, and I put in a little footnote referring to them because they had been published summarily in, I think, 1911. And I got drawn into it. They actually had that publication in our crummy library at University of Buffalo, so I went and looked at it. Um, and uh, my uh, footnote turned into a sentence and then turned into a paragraph and then turned into a section in this article I was writing and eventually became a 116-page article. Uh, that I uh, published in a supplement of uh, the Journal of Roman Archaeology, which provides this uh, kind of uh, uh, thick description of what's going on with this set of documents, which I eventually also gained access to. Everyone had thought they had been lost. Um, on the right, I show you a, a fragment of an inscription from downtown Rome, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, what it is is it's an inscription which specifies to landowners who are delivering wine to Rome being collected as tax in kind, probably in the fourth century AD CE again, um, uh, the various tips they have to pay to all the various functionaries that are there to receive the wine. Uh, and uh, you probably uh, can't read that Latin because it's not clear and you probably don't read Latin anyway, but I know there are a couple people in the room, uh, but uh, it uh, it's, uh, says some, uh, uh, some uh, cool stuff. It says, uh, let me pick out the part. Uh, it says, uh, oh, and with regard to the uh, uh, ampullae, which is the diminutive of amphora, it says, after the tasting, uh, it's been decided that they should be given back to the landowner. Uh, and uh, that's kind of an interesting and disputed uh, line. But the point is, is the amphoras I'm showing you there, uh, that's the, the, uh, the neck and then the, the base of a, a K52, uh, which is, in fact, a wine amphora of this period uh, from kind of the uh, Calabria area just uh, across the Straits of Messina from Sicily. And so if we're trying to understand the explosion of this sort of amphora appearing in our assemblage, uh, we have to take account of the fact that by the fourth century the state is collecting wine as tax in kind and selling it at Rome at a subsidized price. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that uh, I think you need to do to understand this. So uh, by the end of this period, uh, with uh, uh, my tenure clock running out, uh, I decided to uh, uh, take one large deposit of about 500 kilograms of uh, pottery in pretty good shape that has pretty high levels of uh, completeness, low levels of brokenness. We could date the deposit very, very tightly to the v about AD 300 plus minus a few years. Um, and to work that up, to use that as, a, um, as an opportunity to uh, work out the methodology we were going to use for studying and, and publishing the material. Uh, and so I published that as a BAR volume in 1999, uh, got tenure, 
uh, that along with my 116-page article on, the, uh, on those Ostraca from Carthage. Uh, I show you a couple of the appendices from this in which I was uh, developing some of the methodological discussion about how we were going to do this. Um, eventually, uh, uh, Eric Hostetter and Rasmus Brandt, the site director and associate site director, uh, published the first volume of the Palatine East Reports, which discusses the architecture and the stratigraphic sequence and the history of the site and stuff like that. Uh, that was maybe about, I don't know, 2008 something. In about 2014, uh, a team of uh, uh, fine specialists uh, directed by Archer St. Clair of the History of Art Department at Rutgers University uh, published uh, all of the finds other than the pottery. Uh, so glass and worked bone and worked stone and coins and things like that. Uh, and that just left me uh, kind of failing to follow through on my part, which was to publish uh, these 20 tons uh, of pottery. Uh, but as I'll talk about, by that point, the way we published things uh, had changed somewhat. Uh, at any rate, uh, what happened was after a, a hiatus in the late 90s when I was doing something else, in the early aughts, uh, I uh, wanted to go back and, and bring a, a team of grad students from my then institution, the University of Buffalo SUNY, uh, to uh, start working more seriously on the pottery than we had been able to do actually while the excavation was in progress and literally tons of material was flowing in every day. Uh, which we, to some extent, were able to quantify and sort, but we weren't able to do any sort of detailed uh, uh, study of. Uh, so uh, I was able to obtain money from uh, the NEH for collaborative research and also, miraculously, from the Wenner Gren Foundation uh, to support work. And so uh, we did uh, actually uh, three field seasons in 01, 02, and 03, uh, where we made substantial progress on the detailed uh, publication of the material. Uh, we needed a name, so I gave it a nice peppy name of the Palatine East Pottery Project. We have our own logo. No one's laughing, but if you realize that the standard sort of maker stamp that you put on Italian sigillata is called Implanta Pedis uh, in, a, in a footprint, um, we're not exactly sure why they do that. So one of my clever grad students sort of you know, uh, did this, uh, this, uh, this uh, paste up, uh, so we have our own Implanta Pedis logo. Um, and uh, I brought a, uh, a couple of teams out with me then in 01, 02, and 03. Here we are uh, posed in the forecourt of the American Academy in Rome for our team shots. And we made substantial progress then on more detailed work on the material. Um, my uh, main Finnish collaborator, uh, Jana Ikahemo from Oulu University in Finland, uh, has been charged with the, uh, heading up the study and publication of the cookware component of the assemblage. Uh, and he made really great progress. He also kind of uh, had to get tenure. Uh, and so uh, he published a BAR volume on just uh, the African cookware uh, from the site, where he gave a lot of attention to things like use alteration, drawing a lot, for example, on James Skibo's work on sooting and, and things of that sort, with which you're uh, perhaps familiar. Um, and then uh, flowing out from that, he and I, and also my other uh, associate director, Victor Martinez from Arkansas State University, uh, published a a series of short studies and methodological articles and, and things of that sort that were building on the work that we were doing uh, in the years uh, shortly after uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the bimillennium? What's the word we use for the year 2000, Y2K year? Um, anyway, uh, uh, I then became department chair. I had a, a health crisis. Uh, my grant money ran out. Uh, I had other things to do. I, I uh, couldn't go in the field, so I wrote this book, which is probably what got me my job here at Berkeley. Uh, it's kind of an uh, a extended essay, really, on the life history of pottery in the Roman world. It was interesting to me more and more flowing from this. Um, and uh, it was only once I moved to Berkeley and settled in that I was able to begin to get back out into the field to try to bring this to closure. Among other things, the American Academy was sick and tired of much of their storeroom being full with our many hundreds of crates of, of pottery, and they wanted to know if we were eventually going to finish it and get it out. Uh, so, uh, we started uh, Pep uh, Beasts, I guess you can call it, um, and looking at that, I realized that, hmm, that looks a lot like Pepto-Bismol, doesn't it? So, maybe there's some kind of sponsorship opportunity that I can take advantage of. I don't know, does Pepto-Bismol still exist? I think it does. Uh, any event, um, so uh, what this involved was taking advantage of the URAP program here at Berkeley, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, I was given a, a lab, don't think fume hoods and uh, lead shielding and Bunsen burners, but it's a room with a couple of tables in it, uh, tucked under the eaves of Dunell Hall uh, in uh, uh, Dunell 310B. It's uh, called very majestically by me the UC Berkeley Roman Material Culture Laboratory. Uh, but here, most semesters, I'll have two, three, four uh, students under the U University uh, Research Apprenticeship Program uh, doing 
uh, back-end uh, data processing and uh, various sorts of documentary work and things of that sort. Here you see, for example, some of the work we're doing on calculating capacities of transport amphoras and a couple of students pretending to be hard at work uh, in the lab for this picture. Um, I also have been taking small groups out uh, in the field with me to Rome every summer, uh, anywhere from you know, five to eight people, something like that. Uh, so when we're not hanging out in bars, uh, in the upper left, we are uh, posing on uh, uh, the steps around, this is amazing, a building that's built on the foundations of what was Galileo's lab laboratory. We did all those original scientific, you know, astronomical investigations that got him in trouble with the Pope. Uh, I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. That's where uh, one of our lab spaces is at the American Academy. Uh, so uh, uh, you might recognize some of you, I don't know if you know Amanda Dobrov, uh, a, uh, a senior now, under, uh, uh, anthropology major, is doing a senior thesis with me on some of the material uh, from the Palatine East. Uh, but this Google Earth image will kind of show you the, the very um, demanding circumstances under which we have to work. Uh, this is zooming in on the top of uh, the, uh, the uh, Genicolo. Um, those of you who know Rome uh, would know that this is what Romans called the Fontanone, the big, the big fountain. It's a super famous place. It's the highest point in the city. Uh, for example, if you look at Roman holiday, uh, the outside shots for, uh, um, I'm going to get the wrong Hepburn, not Audrey, but... Uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn, she'll tool up in a, little, uh, in a little convertible and hop out and run into this building right here, which is now actually owned by the Spanish Embassy, so there's always like these guards with machine guns in front of it. Uh, but uh, this is a, like a super famous port part of the city, it's the highest place. This massive building here is the main academy building, which was designed by McKim, Mead, and White, uh, purpose built to be an academy in the early 20th century. Uh, they own a bunch of real estate in the area. Uh, this, for example, is owned by the academy, and it's where uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican resides, so Newt Gingrich is going to be living there before long, which really kind of, if he's not already, which really makes one's flesh creep. But anyway, uh, uh, they own this uh, villa across the street called the Villa Caraviglio, and in the basement there are the archaeological storerooms, so a big part of our team is usually hard at work there, and that's kind of nice because you're underground, and so you're out of that great heat that you'll experience in Rome in the summer. And then in the grounds in the American Academy, inside one of the big bastions in the papal walls right here, uh, is uh, this structure called the Casa Rustica, and that's the one that, as I pointed out, was, it's, it's uh, founded on the remains of the building that was, uh, that was uh, 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 Galileo's laboratory when he did his initial astronomical ob observations. So here's the McKim, Mead, and White building. Uh, here's the Villa Chiaraviglia, where most of us working down in the basement. Uh, it's also the building, here's how long I've been doing this, where my daughter took her first steps, uh, and, you know, she graduated from Oberlin College about four years ago and is now... Um, working in IT, uh, and here's a view of the, uh, the Casa Rustica, uh, the, uh, the space out behind. Usually like the American Academy fellow and music is out there too, because like he or she has to pound on a piano, so uh, there's all of these like uh, soon to be famous uh, composers and stuff that you so have to fight over the bathroom with. The, no, we rent apartments up in this part of Rome, which is called Monte Verde Vecchio, which again is a, it's a nice neighborhood. It's the highest area, so it's a little bit less hot and miserable, uh, but it's a, it's a quick, jog downhill to Trastevere, to go out to restaurants and, and stuff like that. A little bit tougher to get back uphill after you've eaten and drunk a lot, but um, it's a very nice location. Um, and we're moving ahead with our work here. Here I'm showing you, uh, and you can't see this at all well, but this is the poster that Amanda Dobrov uh, had accepted to present the AIA meetings uh, just held in Boston at the beginning of January. Uh, and Amanda, as about half the people who tried to attend, got sucked into the great what's it called, cyclone bomb um, and vortex and, uh, and uh, wasn't able to make it. Uh, so uh, this has never been presented, but it does exist. Okay, uh, so what I want to do is move on a little bit now and talk about some of our methods uh, and show you some of what we're doing. Some of this is standard and traditional, but some of it I think I can claim is also innovative. Um, and again, between when I published that BAR volume in the late 90s and now, uh, really, my uh, intersection with the digital world has, uh, has grown astronomically. Virtually nothing I did in that involved digital anything, uh, and now, of course, uh, virtually everything we do does. Uh, we make an effort, first of all, to come up with a, a systematic way of uh, recognizing discrete uh, pottery fabrics, things that are made with what we can uh, distinguish as distinct raw materials processed a distinct way, will classify as representing a fabric. Uh, and to uh, be able to help us identify that, we take advantage of 
uh, a Dynalite digital microscope, uh, which allows us to quickly and easily uh, uh, shoot uh, uh, fracture surfaces, uh, typically at a, at a, uh, uh, at a uh, uh, what do you say, engrandimento, what do you, uh, when you, at a scale, uh, at a, when you, when you increase the size, I'm forgetting the English word for it, that's weird. Magnification, there you go. Magnification of, of uh, about 40 to 50 times. Once you get beyond that with an un, uh, untreated fracture surface, depth of field things make it not worth your while. But here you see, for example, the fracture surface of what's in fact some of this late imperial glazed pottery. You can actually see the glazed surface right there. That's probably made in uh, the east coast of Italy in the area around Ravenna. That's a, a very gritty, uh, coarse rich fabric. Um, and so uh, we uh, uh, break little pieces off with pliers. These aren't museum pieces. Roman pottery is mass produced. And once we give this back to the superintendents, it's going to kind of be like the last scene in Laters of the Lost, Lost Ark, where it just gets put in the storeroom and you know, it gets covered in mold and uh, Lord knows what happens to it. We break little pieces off, glue them onto a note card. And then once you do label and once you do that, you can blow through. And you can take you know, 50, 100 of these photomicrographs in an hour. Um, and they're very low quality. It's only about, a, I think, a 1.8 megapixel camera. Uh, but it's good enough, and it allows you to permanently document that and to uh, open many of them at one time in Photoshop and put two side by side and say, yeah, these are the same, this one's different, put it in another folder, and avoid some of those very frustrating lumping and splitting problems that you get uh, as an archaeologist when you're trying to uh, define uh, discrete uh, pottery fabrics and assign things to them. Uh, so we do things like with our Italian sigillata, we have three distinct fabrics we've been able to recognize. That's probably Arezzo. This is a Tiber Valley fabric. This has, you may pick up, it's got these uh, uh, flakes of mica in it. It has a little bit of volcanic material. I think that's probably Bay of Naples. Um, I've also done a lot of ethnographic work with potters in Italy, so I know the clays pretty well. And so, for example, I've been able to show that there's a chemical match between this fine-bodied uh, Italian sigillata and this lacustrine clay from just outside Arezzo, where uh, it presumably is being made. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm showing you there. Um, for every fabric that we identify, we try to do at least one uh, thin section so that we can use a somewhat bigger bat uh, to, uh, to uh, describe the texture and also identify the, uh, the mineral inclusions and rock fragment inclusions in it. Um, what you see here is, again, if you uh, knew Roman uh, pottery mineralogy, you know exactly what this is. This is a classic fabric from the Bay of Naples area that's full of uh, this volcanic sand uh, from Mount Vesuvius. Um, all of these uh, green mineral grains are augite or clinoperoxine that look like little black grains of sand. It's often called black sand fabric. Uh, big chunks of volcanic rock with uh, plagioclase feldspar microlites in it. This is all classic, classic stuff. This is a type of cookware we have uh, in small amounts on the site, which comes from the Bay of Naples. We were able to do a certain amount of uh, a small program of chemical analysis. It turned out that, uh, again, the site director is from the University of Illinois. The University of Illinois at that point had a Department of Nuclear Engineering, which had a uh, NAA facility. Departments of Nuclear Engineering were always looking to like, do something that did not involve making weapons. Uh, and uh, so periodically, if you were lucky as an archaeologist, you'd be invited to do NAA. And we were given authority to do four Lazy Susans worth of specimens, about 200 specimens. We worked up a program of study where we took all of that fine body regional pottery, which makes sense to study the chemistry of, because it's kind of got a high level homogeneity in the fabric. Uh, and we worked out a program of study where we've analyzed that, analyzed some local clays. We've been able to come up with some partitioning. Um, here you see a bivariate plot uh, of uh, hafnium versus cesium. That, for example, will give you divisions between hafnium is driven uh, probably by the amount of quartz in pottery, uh, hafnium is in uh, uh, zircons. Uh, and zircons are in quartz, uh, so a grittier thing will tend to have elevated hafnium values. Cesium, on the other hand, occurs uh, quite prominently in the regional uh, volcanic mineral grains. Uh, and so if you have some of those in there, that's going to drive up the cesium somewhat. So that's what's driving uh, the, the chemical partitioning. Um, in terms of defining forms, uh, we uh, uh, tend to uh, try to, again, apply a systematic uh, uh, technologically well-founded approach to this uh, to where we pay very careful attention to what I call sur surface micromorphology. That is, by looking at the surfaces of vessels, uh, you can uh, make pretty good inferences about the actual steps that were involved in forming them. Uh, and so here I show you an example of an African sigillata C, uh, Hayes uh, 52 uh, bowl. 
uh, and you can uh, maybe pick up these facets on the outside where the lower wall was, uh, was turned or potters might say trimmed. Uh, on the right I'm showing you just that operation being done by a potter uh, and over here is a little test thing I did myself that I threw and then turned it to look at the difference in the kind of the unturned area and the turned area, how it's compressed and things like that. Um, and uh, I was able to uh, uh, kind of do this sort of, take this kind of analysis which I learned from uh, scholars who worked in the University of Leiden where they had a, a, a department of pottery technology and then combine them with this article written by this guy named Lightfoot on the production step measure uh, and uh, do some useful stuff as I'll talk about. It's the first time I ever heard of this guy, uh, Lightfoot. Um, so uh, we do things like uh, here's a particular Italian sigillata form. Uh, over here is a sequence of uh, the different steps involved in manufacturing it. Um, over here I've taken Harris Matrix Composer software and tricked it uh, to allow myself to compose this flow chart you see which takes us from the very beginning down to the firing to try to um, graph out what's involved in making this. Now, different forms involve different uh, numbers of steps, different amounts of labor input, different kinds of labor input, right? And that's what we're trying to, uh, to understand and also to be able to use eventually to do maybe a, some different approaches to quantification. In terms of uh, documenting pottery, Yane uh, Ikehema, uh, my Finnish colleague, uh, uh, came up with a, a great idea which was before everyone was doing this, we figured out how to use Adobe Illustrator to take our, our pencil drawings uh, and uh, convert them into finished inked drawings. Uh, and uh, what we do is we simply now, unless it's a special uh, case, we simply draw the profile of the thing. We don't draw the exterior view. We put in lines to mark interior exterior details. So it's a lot less line drawing to do. You can get a lot more drawings than one sheet of paper. Uh, we scan them. Uh, we can uh, drop them into uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this little routine we have in Illustrator where Yane has already put in a dummy top line, middle line, interior detail, exterior detail and then we can take those and, uh, and convert uh, the drawing that we've made into a finished drawing like you see up there on the right. Uh, that's what I have a lot of my URAP apprentices doing. Uh, but I always tell them you can't, you know, you can't spell tedious without Ted, right? Uh, so uh, that's what we do. Um, we pay a lot of attention to use alterations uh, to better understand uh, uh, that aspect of, uh, uh, of pottery. Uh, so here I show you uh, a, a couple of joining sherds of uh, African sigillata D uh, of a, a plate which has these quite spectacular uh, cut marks in it, right? Um, that's not so common actually. Uh, and on the left what I'm showing you is the rim of another African Sigillata D vessel uh, which has broken and been repaired by putting a lead staple uh, right through the wall. So you're looking at the back end of that staple. We have a little bit of evidence for the repair of pottery. Uh, and we also see evidence for modification. Here's a couple of shots of transport amphoras. Uh, on the bottom you have one of these tube shaped spathea or K26s which commonly in the Roman world they'd knock the top off, knock the bottom off and use them as, as a pipe or I've even seen a, a well-headed osteo that was built with these kind of like the way you build things out of Lincoln Logs, you know, if anyone remembers what Lincoln Logs are. Uh, so uh, they were reused for that. Um, on this side is the top of a K35 massive wide-bodied oil amphora from Tunisia. Um, they've cut the top off and you can even see that they kind of had a pentimento. They chiseled a little line right along there to try to break it and then they decided for whatever reason to make it a little bit wider and broke it off further down. Um, they were probably trying to get the body of this to use as a sarcophagus, as a coffin for a body, although they might have been trying to recover just the top to use as a, as a funnel or uh, sometimes we get punchy on Friday afternoons, we use them as megaphones and uh, things like that. Now, um, quantification matters a lot because what we're trying to do, of course, is to, uh, is to map the supply of these foodstuffs to Rome, right, to the center of the empire from various places in its, in its periphery. Uh, and so we uh, quantify our materials by uh, four, the four traditional measures. Uh, number of sherds, uh, your weight of sherds, uh, then your estimated vessels represented, which is basically a minimum number of individuals count, like you know, you sort things out by form and you identify you've got ten rim sherds and you can see that three of them are from the same vessel and two are from another vessel, so you have so many different vessels, right, and you can work that out. Um, but uh, has, as has been pointed out that actually that form of count actually has some quite strong biases built into it uh, because if things tend to break into a, a lot of rim sherds and let's say you have uh, a, 
uh, a uh, low level of uh, recovery. Only 10% of the vessel is going to be found. Vessels that tend to break into a lot of sherds are going to tend to have a sherd represented and be found. Ones that only broke into two sherds will have a low probability. And so it turns out, in fact, that while this seems like a very scrupulous way to quantify pottery and has certain positive attributes, it also has some negative ones. So we also do the estimated vessel equivalence count where for each of those specimens, you put it on a diameter chart and you estimate what percentage uh, of the vessel is there and then you sum those. It turns out that that's invariant with variability and uh, breakage rate and uh, the presence of things and stuff like that. So it's, it's very labor intensive and has its own uh, 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 facets of error, I should say. It's, it's tough to come up with a good measure, uh, but uh, we do all of those. Uh, we're also working on a couple of uh, different uh, quantitative methods that uh, are our own. Uh, first of all, uh, it seems uh, pretty obvious looking at the, the lowest of the, the six here in the chart um, that uh, counting amphoras is, is, is useful, but really amphoras are packaging, right, for a, a quantity of, of, uh, of content. Um, and amphoras differ quite radically in their capacity from a low of about six liters to a high of uh, sometimes as high as about 80 liters or something like that. Uh, and so uh, my uh, collaborator, Victor Martinez in particular, who's in charge of the amphora side of things, uh, has been doing a lot of work where we recover profile drawings of transport amphoras from the literature, so not our own because we almost never have them intact, uh, but then you, we have a, uh, a uh, CAD routine uh, where you can uh, convert this drawing into a three-dimensional solid and then you can calculate uh, the capacity of that solid. He's also doing a lot of work with issues about uh, how full they were filled. It turns out that's complicated, uh, but uh, we're moving then towards uh, that as an approach to be able to take our, our, um, our uh, amphora data recovered by the first four types and convert them into something more meaningful. Um, we also are uh, looking at manufacturing cost, although uh, having made some claims about that several years ago, I've kind of been less active in doing that, but it's trying to build on uh, things like uh, uh, Kent's production step measure and our evidence for the number of operations involved in uh, making a form and the weight of a form, because that's how much stuff is in it, right? Uh, and uh, try to combine those in ways that will allow us to come up with different ways of, of, of quantifying the assemblage uh, that will allow us to bring out uh, some, some other points. Um, okay, uh, running out of time here, so I guess I'll get to publication methods. Um, that uh, as I started thinking about how we're really going to get all this stuff through to publication in recent years, um, I uh, realized that the traditional methods, the traditional brick and mortar way of publishing in archaeology is not a particularly good way to go for, uh, for, for pottery in particular, where you have massive amounts of low level data uh, that are very expensive to put into a volume. Uh, and so I made the decision to uh, publish our basic data online. I had sabbatical last year, so I was able to take work that had been done by one of my uh, URAP volunteers uh, over several years but never really leading to closure to teach myself how to uh, do uh, basic, uh, uh, basic Drupal website design uh, and pushed that through and launched a lab website called Race Romani, uh, which will be the basic platform uh, for presenting our, uh, our, our data. Um, uh, here is the page uh, and time permitting, or I see I'm running a bit long, if people want to stick around I'm linked online so I can show you, I can take you into the website and show you how we're doing, uh, uh, doing this stuff. I think it's kind of interesting. So this is the page for uh, PEP. Um, the, uh, uh, the website is supported by the uh, UC Berkeley Digital Humanities Group. Uh, so it's, uh, it's mounted on their server because Nico and I had a grant from them uh, to do something I'll get to in just a second. Um, the plan is to permanently archive this stuff on the, uh, the California Digital Library. Uh, in their archive, which Berkeley faculty are allowed to do. Uh, so uh, after I uh, am gone, have been run over by a beer truck or, uh, or whatever, uh, the uh, PEP data uh, can live on. And uh, the uh, ultimate idea is to also publish a, a set of interpretive, monograph, uh, interpretive essays as a monograph uh, through, uh, if it's accepted, uh, California Classical Studies, which is a, a peer-reviewed, uh, open access online uh, monograph size publication uh, initiative that's be begun, been begun by my uh, colleague uh, in classics, Donald Mastronarde. Uh, again, is trying to take advantage of, of digital approaches to publication. Um, the last thing I'll mention, uh, and then I can open up the website for those who want to stick around and see it, um, is that one element that uh, we uh, need to uh, finish, I pretty much have the whole system uh, for presenting uh, the pottery uh, 
in place. And my idea is to uh, make available these modules as off-the-shelf tools that other projects could use to, uh, to publish their data or modify as they choose to publish their data. But one of the things we received grant money for, Nico and I, uh, was to uh, create a data visualization tool that would be driven by the Harris Matrix. People, I assume, know what a Harris Matrix is, right? Um, and the idea is, is that uh, we would, uh, by uh, having a visualization tool wit written in uh, JavaScript D3, uh, and then with the uh, Drupal module that would allow that to be uh, 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 actualized, uh, we could allow a user to, in effect, uh, surf our Harris matrix, click on a stratigraphic unit, and it would open uh, the database for that unit in the Harris matrix. Um, I also would like to uh, uh, elaborate this too by having like a drop down menu of classes where you could click on a class and it would activate all the stratigraphic units in which that uh, class existed. Um, I've been very derelict in getting this done. Uh, we've had all this ready to go for about two years now, I guess. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, I've got some URAP people who will allow me to uh, get this uh, in place. And, and that's really the, the last element of the scheme uh, that we uh, need to do. Uh, so, uh, I see I'm kind of reaching the end of my time. Uh, this took longer than I thought, but what I'll do is, if people want to stick around, uh, I, I'll open up the uh, Race Romani uh, website, and I can uh, show you a bit about uh, what we've got here. Um, it's not looking so great. Uh, one of the problems is, is that the, um, the template I'm using in Drupal is not the world's best template. It, for example, doesn't optimize for uh, handheld devices, among other things. But uh, under this tab, Projects, uh, I have a page for um, three big research projects. One is La Creta Fata Concreta, which if you know Italian is like a triple pun. Uh, that's the ethnographic work that I've done in Italy. Uh, and then uh, I have the Palatinese Pottery Project. And then I have the project that I, uh, a small project I lead at Pompeii, the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project, uh, which has, for example, been supported by grants uh, from the, the Stahl Fund. Uh, uh, this project, the PEP hasn't uh, received any, uh, haven't had any stall money. But uh, the basic idea on, uh, on each, uh, for each of these projects, uh, and what's happened there? Here we go. Uh, is to uh, provide basic background. And here you have a uh, program of work, so what we've done year by year, uh, authorization, assistance, and funding, what it says. Uh, a uh, description of the site uh, with some images. Um, and then I get down to the big nitty gritty, which is actually presenting the data. And below this, which I think I can get down to or not, sorry if I'm going to have trouble navigating this, uh, I also have ah. well, if I can't get to it, what I have is additional pages of um, for uh, downloadable versions of everything that's in here. The idea is, is that everything I have, I'm, I'm happy to, to give away. Now, um, what I'm doing is, uh, for each of these, uh, let me go back to my projects page here again. Sorry, I'm not that familiar with this touchpad either. Uh, under this part, I have a, a very long methodological discussion. So if you want to see exactly how we're doing everything, uh, for example, how we define a rim as a rim, which sounds Clinton-esque, uh, but when you actually ask yourself on what basis do we call something a rim, it winds up being more complicated than you would think. Uh, and then we have class pages, uh, which are uh, text documents linked to photomicrographs, pottery drawings, uh, photomicrographs of thin sections. Uh, in a traditional format, if you want to know about a particular class of pottery, where, or something like that, you can go to that document, which looks rather like a document you'd find in a traditional publication, except that it has these links to uh, visual documentation. Um, and then I have uh, a series of uh, what I call databases, and these are, in fact, uh, 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 spreadsheets, uh, which include all the data linked in all kinds of interesting ways that allow you to uh, filter it and, and uh, sort it and things of that sort, and link, again, directly through to uh, the documentation, uh, the graphic documentation. And so it gives a, a level of flexibility and allows you to approach things in ways you might not uh, be able to do. Uh, so if, should I stop at this point and allow people to go? Because I think I'm coming around to 1 o'clock, right? Uh, yeah, take a 
So maybe what I'll do is if people need to go or want to go, uh, go. Uh, you can visit Race Romani though and you can, you can navigate this at your leisure. Um, I'd point out in fact that under uh, scholarly products, uh, which sounds pretentious but that's what they call things in Europe, um, and uh, I have uh, various things that I uh, am happy to give away. So I have for example research tools here uh, and um, Uh, there I have uh, all kinds of things ranging from you know, diameter charts to the frames that we drop our photomicrographs into to a 30-minute tutorial on uh, how to uh, do this routine for calculating amphora capacities. I know Christine and I uh, and some of her students talked about this a couple years ago. So all that stuff is there. If you want to cruise it, you might find something interesting and feel free to make it your own and, and use it in some fashion. And also look at our uh, look at our results. Okay, so uh, that's all I'll say. If people want to stick around and talk about anything or have questions, I'm happy to entertain we them. Have a couple questions. Um, yeah, Christine. Are you uh, uh, early on? You were talking about the different sort of care um, contain and for us mm -hmm. use that word, and that they that the, that the clay you're studying the clay and where these amphora come mm -hmm. from. Are you assuming that because that Amphora comes from a certain place that it's sending goods from that place, or do those mm. pot, did those pots move around and then pick up something from somewhere else? Meaning, when you get North African Tunisian mm -hmm. amphora, do you believe that North African Tunisian oil, garum, etc., come came in that? Um, that that's a, a uh, really um, important question. Um, you've asked the wrong person because I'm like that's one of the things I know a lot about. So they just had a big conference in the University of Cadiz about two years ago about efforts to determine amphora capacity, or I'm sorry, amphora content. And I was the person they charged with giving the, the talk on just that topic and I've turned it into a proceedings article which I could send to you, it's not out yet. Um, but uh, the long and the short of it is, is it, it's, it's clear that amphoras were pretty regularly reused for a variety of purposes. Um, uh, our big nightmare would be if amphoras were systematically reused as packaging containers because if you find, let's say, suppose that's the case, you find a Tunisian oil amphora on your site, does that mean, does that reflect the consumption of Tunisian olive oil or Gallic wine or you don't know what? And um, so far the evidence suggests that that was sometimes the case but probably very infrequently the case and uh, our best evidence for that is finding cargoes and shipwrecks. Um, where we have evidence for uh, preserved content uh, and there, there, there's one amphora in particular, or one wreck from the Adriatic, the so-called Grado wreck, where it's quite clear that they were systematically taking amphoras from uh, Tripolitania in Libya, uh, from uh, Tunisia, uh, from the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, amphoras were probably for oil and wine and reusing them for the packaging of fish products. And so the grotto wreck is this one like spectacular nightmare for an amphora specialist, right? Uh, but once you get beyond that, uh, there's some more evidence for this and, it's, and very few shipwrecks have had their amphora cargo systematically and carefully studied so it's not, it's not clear how representative that might be of some broader practice. Um, there's also a, a lot more work being done recently, some by Alessandra Pecci who's spent time at Berkeley, I know uh, that uh, Rosemary Joyce knows Alessandra quite well. She's Italian but a researcher at the University of Barcelona in what might still be Spain. Uh, and, um, uh, and we're also now doing a lot of residue analysis which is allowing you to directly kind of uh, test our ideas about what's in things or see that in fact multiple contents. Um, it's still kind of early days in, in that regard I must say but that's kind of why uh, this conference is organized because there's a lot of movement towards us being able to do better than we've been able to do about um, uh, demonstrating what was the content in amphoras. So to some extent they are being reused systematically as packaging containers uh, but the evidence we have at our, at our command right now uh, doesn't suggest that that was let's say a common practice. But maybe it was common in certain times or certain parts of the Roman world you see so that there, we, there's much more for us to understand about this. But right, the, the assumption that uh, the, the presence of Tunisian amphoras in Rome means uh, consumption of Tunisian foodstuffs is uh, one we still make but we also understand that it's, it's one that's um, problematic in, in certain regards. So that's one, yeah, Ken. So uh, is it rare to find that many of these amphora in one context? 
texts like in Rome? I mean, does this make this really unique in terms of your study, or is it relatively common to find it's, context that have all it's, 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 it's quite common by the time you get into the imperial period. Um, that it's really important to, and I, I also just was at a conference on recycling in the Roman world at Oxford, but they asked me to write the thing about recycling, and so I've been giving some attention to this, is that, you know, by the Roman imperial period, we have in certain, from certain points of view, a throwaway society. We have the, the you know, the mass production of ostensibly disposable packaging. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and consumption sites, by the time you get into the Roman imperial period, is not the least bit uncommon uh, to, to have an amphora, assemb uh, pottery assemblage, which is dominated by transport amphora. So that's, that's entirely common. Okay. Yeah. All right, that was a couple of questions, right? If there aren't any others, uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your attendance. Yeah.